nation says a lot about itself by what it chooses to save. So what does this place say? In the heart of one of the harshest, driest environments in North America, the Paranagat Valley stands out, a watery oasis, refuge for migratory birds and dozens of other species. Humans have lived here for thousands of years. The name means Valley of the Living Waters. Paiutes think of Paranagat as their Garden of Eden, the place where life began. Nearby springs bubble up from an ancient aquifer to fill Paranagat as well as similar patches of green that stretch across Nevada like a string of pearls. From the spectacular vistas of the aptly named Great Basin, the pine forests and aspen groves of the high country, through the alien landscapes of the Mojave Desert, to the stark beauty just outside of urban Las Vegas, Nevada finds itself at the heart of a national debate over the future of public lands. The federal government has seized Nevada's uh, sovereignty. A chorus of angry voices grows louder. Because they lie. They're thieves. They're crooks. On the horizon, a storm gathers. A showdown fed by myths we've collectively nurtured. When the legend becomes fact, and the legend. They're only after one man right now. Who do you think they're after? They're after Clive and Bun. Do they whether they want to whether they want to incarcerate me or whether they want me to shoot me in the back? They don't. They're after me. But that's not all that's at stake here. Your liberty and and uh, 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 freedoms are at stake. And Nevada you know, rancher uh, Cliven Bundy was a natural. Uh, this is really a cattle ranch, and this is sort of the hub for the cattle ranch. There's Even in his very first television there, interview, a cowboy character from Central Casting, to, uh, as if his boots had just stepped out of a classic Western movie. <laughs> Bundy's cattle graze on government land, but Bundy doesn't even recognize federal authority. The BLM started rounding up some of Bundy's cattle before he exploded as a national celebrity and conservative I a, icon. I thought that was a constitutionally protected right. Bundy was known locally for his long simmering dispute with the Bureau of Land Management over grazing rights on his family spread near Bunkerville in the picturesque Gold Butte area north of Las Vegas. I'm a farmer, I'm a rancher, I, I'm producing. I like to see things green. I like to see a brand new calf barn. You know, I, I like to see that. And that's what I, uh, you know, that's what I do. For more than 20 years, Bundy allowed his cattle to fatten up on grasses growing on a 90 mile patch of public land, but without paying the minimal grazing fees assessed by the BLM. You know the way Bundy saw it, BLM's <laughs> management practices had destroyed every other rancher in Clark well, County, you know, leaving Nevada him as the last man standing don't. and squarely in the yeah, middle Nevada of the Bureau's crosshairs. He unilaterally decided the BLM had no right to tell him what to do. My forefathers have been up and down the Virgin Valley here ever since uh, 1877. Uh, they're, they're all these rights that I claim have been created through preemptive rights and beneficial use of the forage in the water. I have been here longer. My rights are all older than BLM even existed. The claimed ancestral rights made for a compelling narrative in news reports, but in court it's been a different story. The Bundy family paid the grazing fees from the 1950s into the early 90s, which is when Clive and Bundy stopped paying in response to new restrictions imposed by BLM. The reason? Gold Butte was listed as prime habitat for an ancient species that had just been designated as endangered, the desert tortoise. Untold thousands of these lumbering anachronisms had been pulverized and paved over during 25 years of explosive growth around Las Vegas. In response to Bundy's defiance, the BLM revoked his grazing permit, but the rancher's cattle continued to roam the public range for another 20 years. Fines and assessments from BLM eventually exceeded a million dollars. During those years, Bundy's legal position morphed into a more expansive claim. He declared the BLM had no authority over any so-called public land in Nevada. In essence, Bundy seceded from the U.S. In other words, they want to treat us just like Britain was treating our uh, forefathers before the revolution. 
and they want to treat us as though we're a territory of the United States instead of a sovereign state of Nevada. Two different federal judges ruled that Bundy's position had no legal merit, that the U.S. government had every right to manage public range, and that Bundy, in essence, has been freeloading, making a profit from property held in a public trust for all Americans. Although Bundy carries a copy of the U.S. Constitution in his shirt pocket, he says he does not recognize the authority of federal judges to rule on public land issues. I'm fighting with the BLM. I go to their court before their judge, and all of a sudden they win. I, I never did get due process. I, I, I've never got my day in a, in a Nevada state court. The judge authorized the government to impound the cattle, and just this past weekend, that impoundment began. As, As the story Monday, percolated into the public well, consciousness, the, the Bundy's predicament a struck a familiar chord with many taxes. Americans. Federal agents came to his ranch to seize his cattle. They came armed, and so did Bundy's supporter. I'm telling you, now I'm going to need all my range. Generations had been weaned on romanticized stories about brave ranchers who single-handedly challenged western wilderness. Good water and grass, plenty of it. Who does it belong to? To me. This road, Hunter S. Thompson wrote, a straight, lonely run across nowhere. The federal government owns 90% of this land, Thompson observed, useless for anything except weapons testing and poison gas experiments. Dr. Gonzo wasn't the first to look at what the locals called the Big Empty and see only a wasteland, an endless stretch of scrub brush and dust suitable for chuckwallas but not for people. This perception is one reason Nevada was the location of choice for testing atomic bombs and for the storage of nuclear waste and experimentation with who knows what at Area 51. Who else has an officially designated world's loneliest road? But if you take a minute to pull off the road and look around, there are treasures on the public lands, weird flora seemingly transplanted from Mars, Twisted monuments created by artistic geothermal sprites, swirling mists in picturesque canyons, rocks with colors so vivid they must be computer-generated images. And at night, you can easily imagine you're stationed on a lunar outpost. Special places like the Great Basin National Park with the jagged majesty of Wheeler Peak at its centerpiece are set aside so they can be protected preserved as is for all time in what amounts to a public trust from a jetliner flying over or a Cadillac speeding through, a traveler might be unimpressed by the big empty. You'd need more than a casual glance to appreciate hidden jewels of the natural world, places that should be kept as they are for future generations. Public lands are such an immense treasure. You have folks from around the world, from Asia, from Europe, coming uh, to the United States and to the West to see our public lands. Nowhere else do they enjoy a public uh, estate like we do here in this country. The question is, have we set aside too much? It's not a new debate. Conflicts over which lands should remain public and which should be exploited for private benefit have long been a staple of Western movies and have shaped modern perceptions of the issues. Ranchers versus homesteaders, cattlemen versus free grazers. In the Old West, as in the movies, the cattlemen wanted to fence off the range to put what was public into private hands. With the westward march of our nation, came the pioneer and the buffalo hunter, the adventurous and the bold. And the boldest of these were the cattlemen who seized the wide open range for their own personal domain, and their law was the law of the hired gun. The revisionist Western Liberty Balance was one of the few to challenge the prevailing Hollywood mythology about stoic ranchers who single-handedly tamed the West. History tells us it was the much maligned federal government which won the West, in particular the U.S. Army, which pacified indigenous tribes with brutal efficiency. Historian Dr. David Kennedy says westward expansion was later kick-started by huge federal projects, including interstate highways, one of which runs right past Cliven Bundy's ranch, 
and especially by massive water projects which made the West livable for millions of people. And those projects are far more important and consequential in the life of this region than all the cowboys and ranchers and pioneers and sod busters there ever were. This region would not hold a fraction of the population it does today if it hadn't been for that investment. Every state has at least some public land. In many eastern states, the percentage is in the single digits, and in some, it's less than 1%. Mostly, that's parks and military bases. 93% of federal acreage is out west, more than 600 million acres altogether. Most western states are dominated by federal lands, but not like Nevada. Nevada is ground zero in any debate about relinquishing public lands. When Nevada was approved for statehood, it signed an agreement to surrender any claims to 96% of the land in our state. Back then, there were only 30,000 people here. The common belief was that most of our arid acreage was simply uninhabitable, which is also why less than 1% of Nevada was ever homesteaded. Fast forward 150 years, Nevada is now home to a few million people, but our state is still 83% federal land. Some Nevada counties are almost entirely federal. Clark County, home to bustling Las Vegas, is almost 87% federal land. Our next door neighbor, Nye County, is more than 98% federal. Lincoln County is close behind. For local governments, this is a permanent handcuff on development and the tax base. But transferring a huge swath of federal land to states or private interests is not a simple matter. A lot of this acreage is simply off the table. Look at government entities in Nevada. The Department of Defense owns hundreds of thousands of acres at Nellis Air Force Base and Fallon Naval Air Station, but it also leases millions of additional acres from other agencies for military training. The National Park Service manages three quarters of a million acres, including the Great Basin National Park and Lake Mead. Uh, those are not going to be privatized. The Department of Energy has set aside an area larger than Rhode Island, formerly known as the Nevada Test Site, where atomic weapons were tested, not a place to build condos. The Fish and Wildlife Service oversees large patches of property in Nevada, much of it environmentally sensitive land where rare plants and animals live. And the U.S. Forest Service is a custodian for gigantic realms of national forest land in Nevada, including Mount Charleston, places which are visited by hundreds of thousands of people each year. Finally, we come to the elephant in the room, the BLM. It manages a vast empire in Nevada, and it's land that's all over the state, with patches here in urban Las Vegas and scattered pieces mixed in with private property in checkerboard patterns. Most of that land is thought of as suitable only for lizards, bugs, and jackrabbits. If any land is going to be taken off the table, the federal rolls, it's probably run by the BLM. That the public land belongs to we, the people of America, everybody. It's, you know, this is America's land. Rancher Cliven and, uh, Bundy's you know, battle against BLM has reignited a long simmering and much broader dispute in Nevada. It, For almost 50 years, Nevada lawmakers have passed symbolic but toothless proclamations demanding the federal government loosen its grip on millions of acres. But Bundy's ranching brethren have taken things much further. Since the 70s, Nevada ranchers have often openly defied federal agencies because of what they see as regulatory overreach. The, the movement was given change. a name. A number of western states are demanding ownership of the land within their borders. The Sagebrush Rebellion, it's called. Count me in as a rebel. I think that the... Uh, it's contrary to the Constitution. It's but candidate Reagan saw things differently as president. He championed sales of federal land as a way to balance the budget instead of land grants to the states. On the ground, the rebellion got ugly. In Nevada, bombs were detonated at federal offices, even at the homes of federal land managers. Uh, we're, we're after freedom. We're after some liberty. When reports about the Bundy dispute began to circulate this year, the issues struck a chord with ranchers who'd already been on the front lines. They and others with various beefs against the government were drawn to Bunkerville, ready for a confrontation no matter where it might lead. Well, I've fought this thing legally. I've fought it politically, I've fought it through the media, and, uh, and I will fight it on the ground if I have to. Many of the other ranchers feel like Clive Bundy, they just don't act that way, because they know that ultimately that will be the end game for them, you know, and it will be for Bundy eventually. Howdy, start. Coming up, a showdown on the range. Expecting trouble? <laughs>
Well, I think if you're going to get me out of the sheep business, you're going to have to cut my head off and hide it. Just when you think you've got ranchers pretty much figured out, thanks to all the FaceTime Clive and Bundy has enjoyed on TV. Hey, Gunner. Gunner wants to play. Come here, you run into a guy who revels in defying expectations. The weapon that's been used against us time and time and time again is that we're just kind of a big bunch of dummies out here. And I don't think you can be a rancher and be a dummy at the same time. I think that's a complete oxymoron. You better have both oars in the water and be able to swim too as a contingency plan in order to survive in one of the toughest, lowest margin businesses there is on earth. Hank Vogler is a sage of the sagebrush, a college-educated former state tax commissioner whose lifelong passion is raising sheep in an environment that isn't exactly a rolling meadow. You have to ask why. Uh, it gets to the point where you're in it because a whatever. Recessive gene. Yeah, double yeah. recessive mutant gene. I've always said that. Yeah. You, I, you know, it, it's a. I wanted to do this all my life. When the land is this dry, it takes a lot of acres to nourish livestock. Vogler's spread is about 3,000 acres of deeded land, but he also leases a million acres from the government. Like the 18,000 other ranchers in the country who graze on public range, Vogler pays a fee, AUMs, okay. that's animal I units per month. The work is hard, blistering heat, biting cold, fires, floods, drought, and predators. But the end result is immensely satisfying. The wool and mutton produced on Vogler's ranch are considered some of the best in the world. Food and fiber, he says, from land that otherwise wouldn't be used at all. Nevada, which once had hundreds of sheep ranches, is down to a mere dozen. It's more than just a business that's dying, it's a way of life that's disappearing on ranches and the rural towns they support. Vogler thinks there's an entire apparatus that thrives on portraying ranchers as the bad guys in black hats. They're saving the earth and all the little dicky birds are going to quit having square eggs and they're all going to live to happily ever after and these evil ranchers. If you think about it, we're a pretty easy target because as far as having any political capital, ours has faded a long time ago. The grazing program was created in the 1930s in response to severe overgrazing on some public lands. In 1976, the authority of federal land agencies was expanded, and the central management goal became the balancing of multiple uses on public land. The multiple use standard is at the heart of most disputes between the feds and ranchers. Critics of the grazing program say the rate charged, $1.35 per AUM, is artificially low and the taxpayers are in effect subsidizing all ranching on public land. I mean, you, you, you look at the grazing industry, we, you know, we take in $17 million a year from the grazers, that's what they pay to use the public land, and it costs just right at $130 million to run the program. Let's, let's the math is pretty simple. This is the highest and best use. Vogler bristles at the suggestion he might be a welfare rancher. The public has no idea how much time and money he and other ranchers plow into improvements on federal lands. Vogler says ranchers who lease public lands must deal with a dizzying array of agencies, not just BLM and Forest Service, but also immigration and homeland security, because some of his sheep specialists are foreigners two different water agencies and multiple agencies which manage wildlife and or plant species. Vogler says there are good people in the local BLM office, but they get overruled by faraway managers or get transferred too soon. And many of the civil servants he deals with are openly hostile to ranchers. Some guys that came in here bragging that the best way to get promoted in the BLM is pick out three or four of the biggest ranchers, go after them, nail them to the wall, cut their allotments 50, 60 percent. It's a yo-yo. You know, uh, you never know what you're going to get. We had a forest ranger here that was just absolutely beyond the pale. I mean, it was like a detective agency. They'd call you up. Uh, I saw five sheep and uh, they'd been on that riparian three and a quarter hours longer than they should have. There were some guys doing a deer uh, survey up here and the biologist told the guy 
that his goal in his life, his lifetime goal was to put me, me personally, out of business so he could reintroduce sheep on that mountain. Vogler is prohibited from thinning invasive plant species that degrade the range by sucking up precious water and by contributing to wildfires which have quadrupled in recent years. Oh, yeah. For instance, his, his sheep, sheep are allowed to eat this black sage species. but this not the silver the sage growing right next to it. But if you look around, 98 percent of this field is black sage. Sheep will take that. Cows won't hardly touch it. The greatest pressure on public lands and those who use them is from nature. Three straight years of drought covering about 90 percent of Nevada have greatly stressed federal lands. A 2014 report based on BLM's own records written by the environmental organization PEER asserts that livestock grazing has by far had the greatest impact on public lands and when combined with drought has caused more than a third of BLM lands to fall below government standards for health the range. Pierre accused the BLM of omitting the impact of livestock grazing from its evaluations of rangeland conditions. But this year, BLM imposed major cutbacks on grazing allotments in Nevada, 60 percent in some districts. Ranchers want heads to roll. They even staged a nationwide horseback march on Washington to protest the grazing cuts. The timing couldn't have been worse, coming just after Clive and Bundy drew his line in the dirt. I had 52 neighbors in Clark County, 52 ranchers in Clark County. And right now I, I stand alone. I'm the last man standing. Unlike Bundy, the rest of the ranchers who lease public lands have paid their grazing fees. But a lot of them agree that federal agencies seem intent on shutting them down. See, that's what they always beat us over the head. They go, well, I have a degree in range management. I know all about this. Well. I've got several degrees in range management, but I have to pull my pants down to show you the scars. You know, I, I mean, I know a little bit about it too. Coming up, a fight that began over endangered reptiles boils over. This is our land! Open the gate! And a larger battle looms. going to be our freedom inside of that uh, fence there. First Amendment rights. In the spring of 2014, rancher Clive and Bundy right gave a tour to demonstrate the Maybe ominous right presence our, uh, that was building around his ranch, including what the BLM had designated as First Amendment zones, enclosures where the public would be allowed to protest against what the government had in mind. This has become a, a police state. And this is proof of it right here. Dozens of armed federal agents and private contractors sealed off 600,000 acres around Gold Butte as they prepared to round up Bundy's cattle. Bundy had racked up a million dollars in unpaid fees in defiance of two federal court orders. Whatever it takes, I'll do whatever it takes. And it hinted more than once he would defend his ranch with arms if necessary. BLM was advised against a show of force, but the buildup continued. Confrontation seemed inevitable. You want to tase me? Go ahead! News coverage of government agents with dogs and tasers sparked outrage. Bundy supporters began to converge on the ranch, including militia groups, sovereign citizens, and a wide assortment of people whose common denominator was a distrust of government. As the BLM roundup of Bundy's cattle got underway, the firepower on both sides became more apparent, and some were clearly itching for a shootout. Had to happen sometime, might as well happen now, right? Bundy seemed to enjoy his newfound status as a media fixture. His but rhetoric grew more heated with each people. appearance. They want a long, good, hard battle. We're ready. My next guest, Cliven Bundy, back with us tonight. Cliven Bundy, back with us is the rancher himself, Cliven Bundy. Man, Hannity ate up that story so hard, Bundy should have charged him grazing fees. The standoff culminated when Bundy supporters marched toward the BLM compound, intent on releasing the captured cows. Hey, we're push these people back. I understand. We we're talking about cattle, not human beings. A phalanx of Metro police stood between the two armed camps. Officers knew that one loud noise could have set off a bloodbath. If it had started, a shot is fired, mm -hmm. there would be dozens of dead people. Yes, death, at least a dozen, at least a dozen. 
Could have been a lot more than that. You got to move them all the way back to the other side of the freeway. Okay? At the urging of police, BLM stood down and released Bundy's cows back onto the public range. But the story was far from over. We made a safe range out of this. Some of us died doing it. We made it. And then people move in who never had a raw hide it through the old days. That's off my range. You talk about rights. You think you've got the right to say that nobody else has got any. Well, that ain't the way the government looks at it. In the classic Western movie Shane, what appeared on the surface to be a battle over cattle grazing was actually about changes in society and its values. In Gold Butte, cattle were front and center, but it was a commitment to the protection of the desert tortoise that started the ball rolling. 25 years of relentless growth in Nevada had gobbled up and paved over key habitat for the tortoise. The Bundys say BLM had done very little to manage lands in Gold Butte until it imposed grazing restrictions related to tortoise habitat. Bundy contends that cattle and tortoises could coexist and felt the evidence to the contrary was weak. Political and legal pressures from environmental groups forced the hand of a BLM that seemed reluctant to challenge Bundy. Well, I think all you have to do is, is take a look at the condition of the land and how degraded it is by year-long grazing with very high numbers, higher than would ever be, you know, economically viable for a rancher if they had to pay for the feed. You know, I don't disagree that cattle and tortoises couldn't coexist uh, at a certain level. And if you grazed it properly, if you grazed it at certain times of the year when the tortoises weren't active, if you, if you grazed it with a number of cattle that were compatible with the capacity of the desert to support it, which it's not. At the time of the roundup, Bundy had 10 times as many cattle on the range as had previously been permitted. It appears that the desert tortoise is, is in trouble. Despite hundreds of millions of dollars spent to protect the desert tortoise, the numbers overall have continued to decline, though everyone admits accurate counting of tortoises is sketchy at best. Nevada's unique environment is home to 27 other species that are listed as threatened or endangered, including rare desert fish, along with 10 plants that are in trouble. Federal land agencies have a tough time balancing the multiple use policy with the needs of those plants and animals. But no single challenge is greater than the one posed by a chicken-sized bird, the sage grouse. Climate change and human activities have combined to severely restrict sage-grouse habitat. Years of study have gone into whether the bird will be designated as threatened. Western states are collectively holding their breath. Sage-grouse is desert tortoise on steroids. Nevada Senator Harry Reid says Nevada ranching, mining, energy development and other activities on public lands could be severely restricted if the sage-grouse is listed as threatened. Well, it covers a much wider area than the desert tortoise, and it's a more complicated problem. For ranchers like Hank Vogler, sage-grouse restrictions could be the difference between staying in business or going under. Vogler says the government found that sage-grouse increased by 20 percent on the land where his sheep graze. He suspects the bird could be used as a weapon to pummel ranchers. It's a tool, and if it wasn't the sage-grouse, how about the pygmy rabbit? They live in burrows. They, they, uh, they dig holes in the ground. The best protection for sage grouse, he says, would be to kill ravens, but they too are a protected species. That's the number one nemesis of the sage grouse. But what do they say? They put a, a, a camera on a, a sage chicken, a bunch of them. They, the 80 percent of the nest disturbance uh, was by predators. Of that, 60 percent was ravens. And what do they say? Get rid of the rancher. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's a characteristic that they'll peck a hole in the top. Ravens are also to known to feast on young tortoises. In the Mojave, the raven population has increased more than 500 percent in the last 20 years, according to BLM. Some ask, what's the big deal if a few more species disappear? We can't assume that uh, the, the world is always going to be hospitable for a sage grouse or every other uh, being that's ever inhabited the planet. Free market advocate Jeff Lawrence suspects that endangered species are merely pawns dispatched by anti-business environmentalists. Uh, there are a couple endangered species that uh, have uh, found a new market uh, when people started eating them, for instance. Uh, it creates uh, an incentive for uh, farmers to 
you know, uh, grow livestock and things like that. Are you that. Go, uh, advocating sage grouse burgers or uh, tor <laughs> tortoise burgers? That might be one solution, actually. Balancing one species against another, one land use against another, is a challenging task. It becomes more complicated when resources worth billions of dollars are concentrated on public lands or when new technologies require space to grow. The public, to answer your question, is getting the short end of this deal on these lands. That part of the story, next. Wild Mustangs running across the open range. Few images are more iconic, more deeply rooted in the American psyche. The public has expressed overwhelming support for the protection of wild horses, yet few programs in government are held in lower esteem. Is BLM the worst agency in the federal government? Well, it is, George. I, I, I believe it is. And I think the facts will support that conclusion. Uh, all these agencies have huge challenges, you know, on the public lands. But it seems that the BLM struggles a lot more than some of the other the sister agencies. Jerry Reynolds admits his biases. He's worked with horses his entire life, has been an advocate for the Mustangs for 30 years, and butted heads with BLM as a district manager for Senator Harry Reid. The BLM spends more than $70 million per year to manage wild horses, but that management consists almost entirely of rounding them up then paying vast sums to private contractors, many of them with BLM connections, to corral the Mustangs for the rest of their lives. There are now more horses in government holding facilities than there are on the open range. 40 years of managing the wild horse program, we've made no, literally no headway, no inroads into new and innovative on the range management. Reynoldson and others allege that so many BLM managers are from ranching backgrounds themselves that they succumb to pressure from ranchers to get rid of what cattlemen see as cockroaches of the range. They've targeted the wild horse for, in this case, total elimination. Two former BLM uh, employees, wildlife ecologist Craig acres. Downer and BLM yeah, wrangler John Phillips, needed. say BLM routinely blames horses for damage it finds on the public range, though cattle are the true culprits. 40,000 horses roaming over millions of acres in the West are considered bad for the range, but one and a half million cows and sheep are not. Millions of acres set aside as Mustang habitat have been zeroed out wiped clean of horses so cattle can graze. The last horses were removed from Red Rock Canyon more than 20 years ago, ostensibly a temporary move so native grasses could regrow. The grasses are now overgrown, potential fuel for wildfires, yet the horses have never been allowed to return. Rounding them up and putting them in a pen somewhere in the middle of the country doesn't help the horse, it doesn't do much for the problem. Because Nevada Congresswoman Dina Titus says BLM is often tone deaf, even when dealing with elected officials. I get frustrated with BLM too, they're not very responsive. I dealt with them a lot with trying to save Red Rock and you know, it was like pulling teeth sometimes. And they're not very transparent uh, with the community, so that breeds suspicion. When residents of Tiny Cold Creek turned out to express their opposition to a planned roundup of their town's beloved wild horse herd, they found out all comments had to be in written form, not spoken. It was the same story at a recent meeting in Nye County held to solicit public input about a proposal to create new wilderness areas off limits to vehicles. Could I would say by looking at the crowd here, 90% of the people are not happy with what the BLM's doing. They probably really don't care what we have to say. This just checks off a box saying that, hey, we reached out to the public. They're required by law to, you know, get solicit public comments, but the public comments have no impact on the process and the decision that's ultimately made. So why waste the time? But critics say BLM is responsive to some voices. In fact, it used to be a standing joke that BLM stood for the Bureau of Livestock and Mining. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, they still haven't overcome a lot of that uh, tradition. The Interior Department has been scandalized because of cozy relationships between its employees and corporate interests doing business on government land. 
public lands are a repository for unimaginable riches, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of oil, gas, coal, uranium, and metals. Drillers already pay billions per year to the government for the oil and gas they extract from public lands, but the royalty is low, 12.5 percent, less than half of what the state of Texas charges for drilling on its state lands, and far less than royalties charged by other western states. It's a bargain for the oil companies, but not for the public. These are our lands that we want protected. The stakes Instead and profits salt, are rising okay. because Players fracking has come to public lands, to raising concerns Houston, about effects on groundwater. Westerners know about the costs and benefits of large-scale mining. Nevada gold mines are so gigantic they can be seen from space. What looks like a toy truck at the bottom of this gold pit is actually as large as an average house. This one state produced almost 70 percent of all U.S. gold and 23 percent of the silver, along with other metals, most of it from public lands. In 2011, for instance, Nevada gold mines produced more than eight and a half billion dollars worth of gold, but didn't pay a dime in royalties because there is no federal royalty for hard rock mining. BLM collected a mere 32 million dollars in fees from those same mines that year. BLM has a reputation as being accommodating to mining companies, such as a new vanadium mine that wants to open in central Nevada. It was funny because one, um, one of the uh, local uh, politicians said he was off to meet the BLM and want to make sure we were being covered and he wanted what message we'd deliver and I said just give him a hug because uh, they've been that good to us. With so many controversies on public lands. After 20 years, they finally got guts enough to do it. And so many pressures in the wake of the Clive and Bundy fiasco, you might think BLM would be hunkered down or at least a bit gun shy. But no, the BLM is just fine. I mean, I think bringing people together to try to find consensus is what we do. And I think often we're able to find it. I do think that more often than not, we are able to find a decision that works for the majority. Of interest. It took sometimes almost four months of pestering to, to get someone from BLM to speak with us about public lands. In light of the open rebellion that's been playing out in southern Nevada and the outrage being expressed by ranchers, environmentalists, animal activists, and public officials who want to strip BLM of millions of acres, what's the mood at the Bureau? There will always be individuals who disagree with the decisions we make. And part of, I think, the strength of the Bureau of Land Management and its processes is it is a very open, participatory, transparent process in terms of whether we're doing NEPA or land use planning. Hearing and bringing in divergent voices and opinions is very much a part of how we make our decisions. The state director points out that hundreds of BLM employees live and work in Nevada. Many of them know their stuff. But critics say there's a disconnect somewhere between the Great Basin and Washington. The director doesn't see it that way. Because we have built those relationships locally, people know us as people and not as bureaucrats, and that's what makes us successful in doing our job. And there are people in the local Bureau of Land Management that know what to do, know how to do it, and would love to do it. But by the time you get it through the layers and layers and layers and layers of government bureaucracy, everything gets lost. Still to come, should federal lands be handed over to the states? And what can we learn from animated reptiles in a cowboy movie? Control the water and you control everything. Disengage, we can find a resolution. The April showdown at the Bundy Ranch ended without bloodshed, but tensions remained high for many weeks. Dozens of armed and angry militia camped out at the ranch, patrolled the perimeter of Gold Butte, even set up checkpoints on public roads. I don't care what you're on. It's a public road. All I'm doing is just getting shots. I'm not no, getting your you're, going, you're trying to come in here and start trouble, and you're standing with that camera no, in my face. Just, it's about money. And it's about a show of force. Oath they, Keepers they and other organizations used social media to chronicle their daily exploits and worried that the government was about to unleash a drone attack on their camp. When we reported that the FBI had launched an investigation of those who pointed guns at federal agents and police, 
Bundy's posse responded with more threats. A few weeks after the big showdown, a pair of misfits who'd stood with Bundy and who dressed as comic book supervillains by night tried to jumpstart a revolution. My fellow Americans. Jared and Amanda Miller, their heads filled with talk radio vitriol and online conspiracies, walked into a Las Vegas pizza parlor and opened fire. Five people, including two Metro police officers, are dead this evening. The Millers died in a bloody shootout, but no revolution erupted. Because they never, they never learned how to pick cotton. Cliven Bundy, who'd already lost many of his media boosters because of racial comments he'd made, distanced himself from the Miller's rampage. But he's barely missed a beat since. He issues news releases, is frequently interviewed, and even appeared in a campaign ad, a six-gun strapped to his leg. A brave white man like you might be just what we need. We can put something on the internet and uh, create uh, a million hits in, say, 24 hours. That, that means something. Bundy seems to take partial credit for the November elections. Our election is really showing uh, what we the people are wanting. I'm not, not talking about just we the people on Bundy Ranch, but what, r across America. You know, we're st we started to elect the people that believed in the Constitution again and believed in states' rights. And uh, those, those people are now legislators and congressmen. Among those who express support for Bundy or opposition to the BLM are Nevada's newest congressman, new attorney general, and a top-ranking state lawmaker who drafted a bill to put restrictions on BLM officers. Bundy says he's not worried about the FBI investigation. A bodyguard who follows him everywhere is present, Bundy says, so there will be an eyewitness if or when government snipers shoot Bundy down. Does he expect to be martyred? I'm not seeking to be the leader. I'm not seeking to be a prophet or, you know, even a governor or anything like that. That's, uh, I'm a rancher and I want to be a good father and a good rancher and I want to be a good producer for the nation. That's what I want to be. The government backed down. Bundy's cattle still graze on public lands. Many lawmen worry this will encourage further action by extreme elements. Across the West, threats and incidents involving federal employees have spiked this year. Some BLM employees have stopped wearing identifying insignia. Rural sheriffs have compared BLM to a foreign army occupying their land. In May, protesters ignored BLM restrictions by driving ATVs onto a trail that had been closed to protect Native American artifacts, and elected officials labeled Bundy's buddies by the left have called for the seizure of federal lands by force if necessary, and large-scale transfers of land to state control. In northern Nevada, business owners worry about new restrictions that might limit access to public lands. At this point, BLM is the, you know, it's the biggest target, it's the most land. And it wouldn't take a whole lot. Uh, you know, what people back east don't realize is every one of these pickups that pulls driving down the yard in Nevada has a rifle in the back. A BLM proposal to withdraw thousands of acres of land as wilderness in Nye County, which is already 98% federal land, led to open discussion of Bundy-inspired armed resistance. Do it. Meet them at the county line. We all pack. We all carry. We got a big force here, a big, big force shows how bizarre this thinking of all these people are. People coming with guns strapped to their sides. During the Bundy because standoff, Nevada you know, Senator Harry Reid was vilified as the mastermind behind an illegal land land grab by the Gestapo land BLM. The unfounded rumor was that Reid wanted Bundy's land so he could build a solar plant for Red China. Reid received death threats, though he had no role in the BLM action or the two federal court orders that started it. He's ruining our public lands, and I'm confident that sometime he will be brought to justice. He hasn't been yet, but he should be. 240, 240, and now 250. Reid has been a principal architect of many public lands bills, including the most effective mechanism to date for putting public lands into private hands, known by its awkward acronym SNIPLMA, Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act. The way it works is the BLM puts certain land on a disposal list, then auctions it off to the highest bidder. Those sales, more than 45,000 acres so far, have generated more than $3 billion. Percentages are earmarked for water projects and schools. Since the proceeds have to be spent in Nevada, BLM has been able to purchase environmentally sensitive lands elsewhere in the state and has more acres now than before the land sales started. 
Millions of those dollars went to programs that preserve and protect Lake Tahoe, one of Nevada's national treasures. But all across the West, a drumbeat grows louder, the call for tens of millions of acres to be turned over to states or privatized. In 2013, the Nevada legislature authorized a task force to study the issues. The task force recommended that seven million acres of BLM land be turned over to Nevada, and a study predicted it would generate $200 million a year for the state. The Bundy Ranch fiasco became an argument used in favor of the transfer. There, there's a reason that resonated uh, far across the West, uh, not just in Nevada, but uh, people have um, become more and more hostile or uh, uh, have shown more antipathy toward federal control uh, of most of the West. I think uh, people who live and work in the state have a better idea of what resources are available and how they can best be managed. We can't afford it. We just don't have the money to take care of all those lands. Assemblyman Paul Aisley chaired the legislative look at public lands. He says the study, which suggests Nevada could make money by taking over the land, is preposterous. More comprehensive studies done in other states show the costs would be tremendous, much more than strapped state budgets could handle. Wildfires alone would cost tens of millions per year. Plus, there are hundreds of employees in Nevada working BLM, Forest Service, and so on, where are we going to put them? Which county will take them on and put them on the payroll? All they can do is send a resolution to Congress asking Congress to free it up. So I don't think it will be successful, but certainly that's, that's the push. One of the things, though, is that, that that's misleading. They think this will lead to all new money and new taxes and new development and help the economy. They forget that when you take land out of public um, stewardship, you lose all of the federal resources that go into protecting it, to managing it. Is there middle ground, something in between Bundy's revolution and total federal control? Call me a Pollyanna if you'd like, but I think it is possible. In the Valley of the Living Waters, nature's ballet unfolds as the sun begins to slip behind the foothills. In some ways, Paranagat is a living example of how public lands can be managed for multiple uses, a refuge for species, open for camping and boating, a source of water for ranchers and farmers. Paranagat is also testament to the old adage, be careful what you wish for. That's the immutable law of the desert. Control the water and you control everything. The quirky animated western so Rango stuff. was the story of a rural town sucked dry by big business and evil politicians. The culprit turned out to be a water-wasting anomaly in the desert, Las Vegas. It almost played out in real life, and if Las Vegas leaders had their way, the springs that fill Paranagat and which are the source of life for plants and animals, ranches and towns, would have been drained. The so-called water grab proposal would build a 300-mile stretch of pipelines and pumps from Las Vegas into central Nevada and siphon away billions of gallons per year. Casinos, developers, and politicians wanted to continue decades of runaway growth, even though comprehensive studies showed the water grab would create a death zone around a vast area of public land. But in court motions, Nevadans have used federal standards set for public lands to thus far block the water grab. In tiny Baker, Nevada, a gigantic slice of pipeline is a constant reminder that sometimes unpopular federal rules might have helped save them, though it's not over yet. Water is always going to be a limiting factor no matter who owns the, the land, whether it's the federal government or the state. States might be able to make profits off of unused lands, but only if those lands are turned over to private interests. Westerners are spoiled because there's so much public land out here. The people who know it best are those who work on it. I think it's amazing, um, the park, I come from back east and there's very little public lands and it's an incredible resource to have access to all this BLM land, park service land. We know that places like the Great Basin National Park generate tourism dollars, but some things can't be expressed in dollars and cents. What's the price tag on a view like this? One effect of transferring vast tracts of federal land to states than private entities is that access would change. In general, it would be ours to run and to take care of and sure. to put up signs that say private private property, no trespassing. If the 
federal lands were turned over to the state of Nevada, it would be a disaster. Senator Harry um, Reid says the new Republican Congress might be persuaded to sell some public lands to the states, but it's unlikely they would simply give it away. States don't have resources to manage it, Reid says. All they would do is put it up for sale, and they would sell it a bunch of rich people. But federal agencies also cut off access to public lands at times. Theirs is an enormous undertaking. The agencies are stretched pretty thin, and the balancing of multiple uses almost guarantees that every decision will mean someone is unhappy. People hate the BLM, but they're really only carrying out the policy of the Congress. They become kind of the whipping boy for policy that people don't like. For example, in response to pressure from environmental groups, the BLM has streamlined the process for the approval of renewable energy facilities on public land, supplanting dirtier coal-fired plants. But new wind projects have been slammed because they kill bats, and vast solar arrays on Nevada lands are known to fry birds. BLM is damned either way. Wild horse advocates despise BLM, but they admit the Mustangs would have almost no protection at all if public ranges were transferred to state control. Even defenders of public lands admit there should be some kind of process, perhaps similar to what Southern Nevada has, for taking at least some lands off the federal rolls, while at the same time protecting special places, such as the newly created Tule Springs National Monument. But it has to be considered piece by piece, not all at once. You need some land around this area for development, some area over here for mining, some place here needs to be protected because of an endangered species. I think that's how you look at it. You don't just say, well, it should be 50 percent and we're going to free all the rest of this up. Mining, ranching, nature, water. All the different aspects of public lands are interconnected, whether we want them to be or not. Sort of like ecology itself. Take care of the individual pieces and you take care of the whole. So there is a whole suite of things that are irreversible that are going to happen over the course of the next century. And uh, so the, the drought that we see now is just a precursor of what's going to be in the future. Meaning you got to manage it better. Meaning that you're going to have to manage it better and you're going to have to manage it differently. We've got to understand, and I think increasingly we do understand, that there are things we're obliged to do uh, as good stewards of the planet and we can't just assume that it will forever yield to our wishes. This land is your land and this land is my land from the California to the New York Island from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters this land was made for you and me as I went a walk in that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway, saw below me that golden valley.